Thanks a lot, uh, Lars, for your kind introduction. It's a really a great honor for me to uh, be able to tell you uh, about one of my passions this evening, and I hope you will enjoy it. But any audience of mine that includes students, and I have plenty, do have to work. So you will have to work this evening as well. And let me start my lecture by making you work. OK? So I'm going to uh, immediately disappear for a moment. And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to do a quiz, OK? Just to test your knowledge. And so we'll see how it goes. Huh? It's um, required that you are quiet because I need you to pay attention to something, OK? So don't run away. I'm running away. But you have to stay. What did you hear? A flute, yes. Good students. <laughs> A flute. I'm going to disappear again. Okay. Now, what was that? <laughs> A recorder? I'm going to do that again. <laughs> A whistle, yes, I can live with that. Anything else as a suggestion? A whistle for me is a small flute. OK? So this talk is about stars. But um, I was playing these two instruments. And so uh, what you were hearing were sound waves that I created by blowing a big flute and a smaller flute. OK? And the bigger flute had the lower tones, and the smaller flute had the higher tones. I want you to remember that throughout the talk, because that's part of the story I'm going to tell you. Um, for me, stars and star quakes, stars are just instruments, musical instruments. And so that's why I always like the analogy with music that you know of. And I see this beautiful piano here. I didn't know it would be here, but I can't play it anyway. <laughs> so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't take that challenge. So let me start off by moving to stars. And stars are um, shining. Yeah? They are shining because they happen to be able to do nuclear fusions. They are nuclear reactors. We, can, we humans cannot do that very safely here on Earth to create energy. But stars are really stars in that. Yeah. And so they shine in contrast to planets. I want to set that straight, because this talk is about both stars and about planets. We do see the planets of our solar system in the night sky. That's because they reflect the solar light. Yeah. So planets are not able to create radiation in the same way as stars do. That's because inside the stars, the temperature and the density of the gas, because stars are just gaseous spheres, is so high that they are able to do nuclear fusion, nuclear reactions. So this is a complex process that creates radiation, and that's how stars shine. So because planets cannot do that, they can just reflect the light of their uh, host star, so to speak. Um, they are much fainter in brightness. Huh? And so you have to imagine that if we would be somewhere else in another galaxy, huh? and we would be looking at the sun, we would not be able to see very easily the planets orbiting around the sun. 
because the solar light is overwhelming. And nevertheless, we want to go and search for planets around other stars. So that's going to be the second part of my talk. So stars are nuclear reactors, and that's uh, you should be grateful to the stars. And you should uh, specifically be grateful to my pet stars. And these are stars that are massive, as we say. So they contain more material than the sun. Um, typically five to up to 200 times more material than the sun because the, the larger the mass of the star is when it's born, the more efficient, so to speak, is the nuclear reactor inside of it. And so by doing nuclear fusion, stars can build up chemical elements. When the Big Bang happened and the universe was born, there was mainly only two very light elements, hydrogen and helium. And everything else was created inside stars. So also, the chemical elements in your body was made by stars. So you should be grateful, because we wouldn't be sitting here. Okay? Now, um, we know more or less how that works. Yeah? And so that's quite well understood. But still, we have a lot to learn. Huh? And stars, they are not only uh, born when they are able to do <coughs> nuclear fusion, but they also lead a life. Huh? And here is a sort of a schematic uh, picture of stellar life in the case of the sun, our own sun, the, the star we know best. Huh? So the sun was born out of a, a, a dusty cloud, let's say, in the galaxy. That's how it works. And then she starts doing nuclear fusion and starts shining. Huh? And this goes on for a really very, very, very long time. Yeah? Um, you see that here uh, in the graph. Yeah? And so we are about halfway the solar life, more or less, now. now at a certain moment, huh, when the, uh, the material inside the sun will have been transformed from the lightest element, which is hydrogen, to the second lightest element, which is helium, yeah, then the nuclear reactor will come to a stop because there is no more hydrogen to transfer into helium if all the hydrogen has been burned, as we say. Yeah. Now, in that moment, the sun will hit an energy crisis. Yeah? And so this will uh, cause the sun to be able to grow, and the star will become a red giant, as we call it. You see that indicated in this graph here. So as I said, this will happen in about you know, uh, uh, 5 billion years from now, because the sun is halfway through this path. Now, that's not such a pleasant period for us here. Because the sun will swell up, yeah, and the radius will become huge. And so at that moment, we are hitting a real global warming phase. <laughs> yeah? You don't have to be too worried about it, on the other hand, because you know, you will no longer be around nor will your children or your grandchildren, uh, given the time scale. Okay? After that, the sun will still continue to live for a while, but she will expel the outer gas layers and then turn into a tiny little small ball. Small means as small as the Earth. Yeah? And it will be uh, full of, of carbon and oxygen that the sun created uh, meanwhile. So, in fact, it will be just a beautiful diamond in the sky. Yeah? It's full of diamonds in the sky. You cannot grab them. I'll come back to that later on. But that's more or less what's happening. That's for stars that have more or less the birth mass of the sun, uh, something not too different from that. Stars that get born with uh, sorry, that was too fast, with uh, more mass, they are the more violent types of uh, objects in the Milky Way, because not only do they live much shorter, huh, the, the, the more mass a star gets when it's born, the shorter it, it can live, 
but it will also explode uh, in the end, and that's very violent. That's what we call a supernova. So we know how stars get born, live their life, and die, more or less. Yeah? But all the, that information that we have comes, in fact, from the light that we get from the star, that it shines through its outer surface and then comes to our instruments and we can detect it. Yeah. Now, recently it has become clear that even though we have this uh, so-called theory of stellar evolution, we do have some shortcomings. Huh? And an illustration is given here in two cases. These are artist impressions of observations. Uh, of two stars that have gone through this red giant phase, you know, that have uh, become very big, but that nevertheless seem to have planets surrounding them. So this was reported in various uh, papers, and it was actually considered good news, because it was thought, oh, maybe the Earth will survive. Huh? Maybe. Or maybe these planets have formed in a different way afterwards. We don't know it very well. But these examples illustrated that our theory of stellar evolution is perhaps not yet perfect, and we still have a lot to learn. Yeah? And so that's what this man here, uh, Arthur Eddington, who was considered sort of the, the godfather of, of the theory of stellar structure and evolution, um, wanted to do almost a century ago. He was quite frustrated because he couldn't do experiments inside a star yeah, in order to see how good our theory is. It would be nice to just fly into the sun and uh, get a piece of material and investigate it in the circumstances that are truly happening there. We can't mimic that in our Earth laboratories because of the too high demands on temperature and pressure. Again, that's also the reason why we can't do nuclear fusion in a safe way here. Yeah. So I consider that an important question in the previous century. Huh? What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the true conditions within the star? Yeah? And my answer to that, and many of us now are luckily in a, uh, an era where we can answer it, is that Starkways give the answer to Eddington's question. And he would be extremely happy if he would be alive today. Yeah. So what are we going to do? We're going to use the uh, vibrations of the stars, quakes, if you like, oscillations. It's all uh, the same uh, meaning in this context to understand what's going on. And this is illustrated here in this graphical uh, cut through, through, let's say, a hypothetical star. And these quakes are comparable to sound waves, just as I created sound waves by playing on the flute. Yeah? Now, of course, there was a bit of a, of a tricky part here because I have a microphone. I went out uh, the room so that you wouldn't be able to see me. But still, you heard sound waves right, that propagate in the medium. And so the, the stellar quakes, the oscillations, create sort of something similar like sound waves. And here you see the, the, the wave pattern of, of a red sound wave, you could say, and of this blue one, and the green, and the yellow one. Yeah. I like the blue one. Why? Because I want to understand what's going on inside the core of the star, because that's where its life is directed. Yeah? Uh, of course, we, all, we like all quakes, huh? so we want to detect many of them. We can't look inside a star, but we know that this is happening here just as I'm creating sound waves now, and they propagate into this cavity in this beautiful auditorium. Yeah? Now, if you can do a measurement of these uh, sound waves, of these frequencies, these tones, yeah? and imagine you could do it for this yellow and this green wave, yeah? What you see here is that these waves, well, they feel a slightly different physical condition in the area where the green can pass, but the yellow cannot. Yeah? And by measuring these different frequencies and comparing them with each other and subtracting them from each other, we can understand the physical condition of this tiny little area here. Yeah? It's very much the same principle than what 
seismologists of Earth do to study the core of our planet. Huh? I, if you want to understand what's going on in the deep interior of our planet, it's too hard to drill a hole here until we reach it. But that's, in fact, what we would like to do. But we can't do that experiment in practice. It's the same for the stars. We cannot grab a piece out of the core of a star. Right? But the waves created by the Earth, either because there is a natural earthquake or because it's uh, artificially invoked, yeah? they create waves that travel through the Earth, bounce at the core of our planet and come back. And so by measuring these frequencies and these travel times, we can deduce how big the core of the Earth is. Yeah? We do the same, but then for stars. Yeah? It comes down to that. Now, let me come back to the analogy with the music. Huh? If, uh, if you all know about the, uh, a string of a guitar or of a piano, huh? musicians can play that in different kind of tones, different kind of modes, we would say. Huh? Like the fundamental one, it goes up and down here. Or if the musician puts a finger in the middle, then you create a note, and then the tone is different, right? First overtone or the second overtone, and so on. Yeah? And so in the case of a one-dimensional musical instrument, that's easy to describe. Each oscillation is characterized by the frequency of the oscillation or the period. That's just the amount of time it takes to have this move up and down. Yeah? And the number of nodal points where the string doesn't move. Huh? In this case, there are no nodal points. In this case, there is one here. In this case, there are two here, and then three, and four, and so on. Okay? So one-dimensional instruments, a frequency, a number of notes, and an amplitude, the strength of the musical tone that you heard. Okay? So now I move to stars, and stars are just three-dimensional instruments. Yeah? So then I do not need per wave, one frequency and one amplitude, and one number to express the notes, but three numbers, because I'm now in three dimensions. Okay? So that's what we will try to detect for stars without being able to resolve the surface. Only the sun, we can resolve the surface, and we can measure directly the solar quakes, because the sun also has multiple oscillation modes. You can't see that by eye, because your eye is an extremely good detector, but not good enough. Huh? We can see these uh, quakes, typically, if we can have an instrument that can measure at a precision of parts per million. Uh, and that's not within reach of, of your eyes. So each of these nodes and modes, I should say, has its own uh, three-dimensional uh, you know, surface pattern, we could call it. And we characterize that by nodal lines on the surface. And so the frequency is something that we want to measure as well. So how does that work? Well, let us come back to music. Um, we can consider the stars really as musical instruments, and that's what we basically do. Of course, we cannot hear the stars play their music, because there is no medium between us and the stars. They are very far away. Yeah? But we can mimic that. So we know the waves that are going on, and we know the frequencies, because these are connected with the extent of the, of the star. Huh? Big flute, small flute. Yeah? So what I have done now is try to transform that and make you sit inside the sun, for instance. Then you could hear a concert played by the sun. Yeah? So since you already did uh, the quiz, you know the analogy. Huh? Uh, here it's uh, drawn by violins, small violin, higher tone, big instrument, lower tone. That's what you expect. Yeah? In practice, we can't see inside the stars. But what we do measure is the consequences of the quakes that are tiny at the surface. But if you have an instrument that can measure them, you sort of have a seismograph, as uh, seismologists of the Earth would call it. And here you see that seismic signal in case of a real star. 
measured by a satellite. Yeah? And so what I will do next is try to give you a, a feeling of what you would hear if you were to sit inside the concert hall of the sun. Okay? Now, these oscillations are quite slow. So I have to cheat a little bit because your ear is not sensible to the frequencies that are happening. So I cheated by multiplication of a factor one million. But other than that, <laughs> you will get a grasp of what's going on. And so I always, sometimes I give also lectures in front of uh, um, uh, artists. Um, and then I will ask you whether you like the symphony of the sun or not. Huh? So let's just first listen to it. <laughs> we are that we cannot hear this, I think, except for musical uh, uh, artists, they, they love it when they hear this. Now what do you see here? You see here a graph which I call the symphony of the sun. So what you see is the strength of the sound, you could say, as a function of frequency and that's expressed in this case in microhertz. And each of these black peaks here is a, a quake of the sun. Yeah? So as you can see, I think, without doing any mathematical analysis as we do in practice, you can see that this, is, this is, has a nice pattern, has a nice structure. So the symphony is clearly structured. Yeah? And the uh, strength peaks here at about, let's say, 3 millihertz. If you would turn that to a period of this vibrating string, let's say, it would be about five minutes. So the solar quakes go up and down with a periodicity of the order, several minutes, let's say. Okay? Okay, now this is the sun. And let me now say that this was the sun. I'm now going to let you hear a star that will be a star as the sun will evolve into when its nuclear reactor gets into an energy crisis. So we know it will swell, it will become a red giant, it's going to be a bigger star, it's a bigger instrument. So what will happen to the frequencies? Okay, let's see if that's right. I like this because this is for the disco. It, this is a true cosmic bass. Yeah? The only thing I did was factor one million to get it in your audible range. But this is a huge star and it's a lower tone. Yeah? These were data observed with a Kepler satellite. Okay, so now we had a sun, we made it big, now we're gonna shrink it to what it will become after or near the death. And so we're going to make it into a, a, a tiny little... Now the sun, then we're going to move to this now. Huh? So what will happen to the tones? Good students. This is a cosmic piccolo. Yeah? These are ground-based data because I like to show them. Uh, even in, if we have satellites. And you hear the beating? Yeah? That's because the frequencies here are much more concentrated near a smaller range. Okay? Now, in practice, we don't work like that as astroseismologists because we can't hear these sounds, as I said. We do a mathematical analysis of the quakes that we see in our seismographs. Okay? But the principle is the same. And you could immediately deduce now, if I, you are experts now, if I make these sounds, you could say if one star was bigger than the other, right? That's not so hard. That's what we do in practice. But then by doing uh, uh, an analysis of a time series of measurements, we follow the brightness variations in time of stars. Okay? 
Now, how do we do that, and why is this field uh, received such a boost the past years? Because we have satellites that can do these measurements of these brightness variations from space instead of from ground-based observatories. Uh, if we do these measurements from the ground, you have to realize our Earth atmosphere is twinkling. There's a whole lot of, you know, uh, I, I would call it rubbish in the Earth atmosphere that disturbs the measurement. And if you need a precision of parts per million, that's bothering us. And so since 2006, for the coral satellites, and since 2009, the NASA satellite Kepler, uh, both of which had also the goal to find planets around stars, I'll come back to that later, have been operating from outside the Earth atmosphere and gives a better precision with a factor typically 100. And that's why we are now able to measure far more star quakes than we could do it from the ground. So what do we do in practice? We let the satellites work for us, and they observe brightness variations in time. These are typical Kepler data, real data. And you see the vibrations of the stars. Yeah? And this goes up and down with a specific strength. And look at this one. It goes up and down, but much slower. Slower means lower frequency, takes longer. Why is that? The sound wave has to pass a really big star here. Remember these waves that I showed in the beginning? It takes you longer before you come back to the surface, if you are a big star. Yeah. So the higher the amplitude and the lower the frequency here, the bigger the star. And so in that way, we get an immediate grasp of the size of the star by looking at the frequencies as we do that. But you can also already see it by looking at the light curves. Huh? Expert eye gets to uh, know this fairly quickly. Now, one of the major discoveries that we made and that we hadn't particularly anticipated were oscillations in stars that are these red giants. And these modes were not detected before and is what we call mixed mode. What does that mean? It means that they pass right through the core of the star, like this purple wave that I showed in the beginning, where I said I like that one, because this can probe the inner regions much better than the red one, which only passed through the outer envelope. And so these modes were discovered in uh, recent data from space in, you can see here the discovery papers, 2011. So, I mean, in the time scale of uh, cosmological studies, this is yesterday. Huh? Yeah? And so that made a real breakthrough, because thanks to these mixed modes, as we call them, um, we can probe the inner region of the star, and that's where all the action happens in terms of nuclear fusion, and that's where the life is directed. Yeah, so thanks to that, we could study the life of the stars in much more detail. And that's what we have explore, uh, explored. Now, for the sun, helioseismology had already set the scenery of the whole method that we do in trying to understand how solar quakes, in this case, um, get uh, disturbed, so to speak, by having a rotation inside the sun. Huh? Th does anybody of you know how the rotation period of the sun is, how large it is? Have you ever tried to measure that? It's, it's very easy. But never look at the sun without glasses eh, that protect your eye. But the sun has solar spots, you know. And so by following these, huh, you can just wait until they recover in your line of sight. And that allows you to deduce the solar rotation at the surface of the sun you would end up with something like more or less 26 days. Yeah? Now, that is the surface rotation. It doesn't tell you anything about how the interior of the sun is rotating. But that's very important if you want to understand the uh, capability of the nuclear fusion again. Huh? I always compare that with uh, drinking coffee with milk, you know? If you, uh, if you like that, what you do, you take coffee, you pour milk in it, and you're not going to sit and wait until it's fully mixed, 
because then it's cold and it's not good, right? So what do you do? You take a spoon and you give what I call angular momentum, right? So if there is rotation inside the star or inside the sun in this case, the mixing is much more efficient. <coughs> right? And if the mixing is much more efficient, it means that your milk can also come to the center of the star and take part in the nuclear fusion. Okay? So that affects the life. And we don't know how the material mixes inside the stars in general. Now, why am I telling all this? Because I want to know how mixing occurs. That was one of the key questions uh, that Eddington wanted to see answered because it can provide us an improvement of the evolution theory of a star. For the sun, this has been done, this had been done since quite some time uh, by means of its solar quakes. Why is that? Well, I'm not going to do the experiment, but let's suppose I was playing flute huh, on a podium here, and uh, the technician there would press a button and make me rotate. For you, that would sound awful. Why? Because the frequencies of my beautiful symphony would be shifted. Huh? It would destroy the beautiful symphony. So, rotation shifts frequencies of quakes of the sound waves. Yeah. So if we can measure these shifts, then we can know how the interior rotation goes. And this is what you see here in a graph for the sun that was obtained by Jörn, in fact, uh, early 90s. So I really learned many things from him. Huh? And what you see here is the internal rotation of the sun this is a part of the sun, in a color scale. And if the layers would rotate at the same speed, let's say, it would all have the same color. There would not be what we call in mathematical terms a gradient. And it's not doing that. So the sun has what we call differential rotation. Yeah? And so if you have differential rotation, you mix efficiently. Think of the spoon. Yeah? And so, we want to try to measure that for stars because it determines their lifestyle, so to speak. Yeah? And you cannot do that by just looking at their surface. How can we do that? We measure shifts in the frequencies of the quakes. Right? And for that, you first need to detect the quakes, and then you have to measure them during a long time because the shift in frequency is tiny. Yeah, so this is long-term monitoring work. In that way, for the red giants, where we had uh, discovered these mi mixed modes by various teams, we sort of used them to probe the interior rotation of these stars. So this movie sort of shows you that we sort of opened up the surface and had a deep look inside and discovered that the cores of red giants rotate faster than the outer envelope. That by itself is not such a surprise. That's what you expect. Because as I said, the sun will turn into a red giant when its nuclear reactor has no more hydrogen to burn. And so what it needs to do is solve an energy crisis. And what will it do to solve that? It will make its core shrink and make it even hotter to try and burn the second heaviest element, which is helium, and transform it into carbon. But by counter-reaction, the outer layers will grow. Yeah? Now, what happens if you have an ice skater who wants to make a pirouette? The person will put his or her arms as widely as possible and pull as fast as he or she can, because then you spin up. Okay? So in a red giant, the outer layers are expanding, are then slowing down, and the inner layers are shrinking and are speeding up. So that's what we expected. Only the factor with the spinning between the core and the surface is wrong in our models. And we still haven't fixed that today. It's something we have to work on. The theory is typically a factor 100 wrong compared to the se seismic data. So that means that our level of understanding of mixing material is not good enough. Yeah. And that's something we have been able to unravel thanks to these quakes. 
Now, here is a, a nice study of uh, six stars, and they each got a, 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 a letter assigned to them, eh, where you see in this graph a plot of the rotation frequency, so that's the spinning rate in the interior, as a function of a number here that sort of sets their evolution. Yeah? So here is younger, here is a bit older. And so what you see here, you see the spinning rate of the core in red and the spinning rate of the envelope, the outer layers in blue. And we cannot watch stars grow old. I started off by saying that they billions of years. We can't do that. But we, this uh, author here, uh, Sebastien de Heuvels, has picked these six stars. And they are a bit different in age. So one has become bigger than the other. And you see this, the core spinning up the envelope spinning down. That's the ice skater principle I just explained. So this is sort of watching stars grow old. Huh? And we understand that only this ratio between core and envelope rotation, this factor here is wrong in our models. So we uh, are working hard on it. And in fact, here at KITP, people are working hard to fix that. We need to fix that in our uh, theory of stellar evolution. Now. Let me move to young stars. How do stars get born? Well, they start off in this molecular cloud, and then you know, they are very big, and then they start shrinking, shrinking. They are not yet a star. They sh the, the cloud shrinks, 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 until it's hot enough to do nuclear fusion. Yeah? That's what we call the birth of a star. And so while this shrinking process is going on, you can also measure quakes. That was something that we already knew, but not yet since long. And this is a path that the star follows while it gets born. So what we have recently unraveled is the stellar formation process, where we have a lot to learn, because we don't know how to deal with this very well in our theoretical models. And we tend to skip that stage. We just all of a sudden say the star is born, and it lives on. But how it gets born is very unsure. And why is that important? Well, because stars and their planets get born together. And this brings me to exoplanetary science. Huh? We would like to know how we came to be here on Earth around our sun. In order to know that, we must know the details of how the sun was born. And that's a shrinking cloud until you get a nuclear reactor. But then there is still material floating around, and that material then accretes and creates planets. Now, until 1995, we had one experiment to test our solar system, and we thought that that was it. Now we know there are plenty of planets around other stars, and these planetary systems are not very similar to ours, necessarily. So that opened up a whole new area uh, in planets. How do we do that these days? Well, we watch a star, and you see that little planet shifting in front of it, making a transit, as we say. And planetary transits, what do they require? They require that you follow the brightness of a star during a long time, and they require that you have an excellent instrument that can measure this tiny little dip here. What do Astroseismologists that study quakes want long measurements in time with a very high precision. And so these two study domains go, for that reason, hand in hand. And the Kepler mission of NASA has really been a tremendous success in this respect. And here you see measurements of planetary transits. We don't see the planets themselves. Remember my first slide? That's too hard because the, the host star is overwhelming in brightness. But when a planet moves in front of it, we see a tiny little dip in the brightness of the host star. That's how we discover planets. Okay. Now, that is not sufficient to study if these planets are uh, habitable or not. You know, when I give talks, I always get the question, give us an Earth, tell us where to fly to, because it's, if it's screwed up here, we need to leave. OK? So that's a task, quite a task. Sounds simple, but it's not. Huh? So in practice, you can measure these dips. 
But that doesn't tell you yet if you have a planet that could be nice to live on or not. I mean, like Jupiter in our solar system, or, or Neptune, or Saturn, they are gaseous planets. They are not what we call rocky planets. And we, if we think of life, we sort of want a copy of the Earth, right? That's what we want to find out, where they are. So how can we improve from these uh, measurements of the brightness? Well, if we add to that measurements in velocity, we can do more. Huh? Because the planets orbit their star, and the star has this uh, motion, just as the planet has a motion. Kepler invented these laws. Yeah? That needs a velocity measurement. Then you can deduce how the mass of the planet relates to the mass of the parent star, of the host star. Yeah? From Kepler measurements, we can relate the radius of the star to the radius of the planet. Yeah? So these two uh, combined can then give you not only the size and the mass, it gives you the density. And then we know if it's a rocky planet or a gaseous planet. Okay, So that's the way this works. Now, that tells you that you need a lot of measurements because the space missions do it for us, but then we still need to measure the velocities from ground-based observatories. And here is a graph that I uh, like a lot from the Kepler mission. It was dated February 2012. Our planets in our solar system, a few of them, we want to find a copy of this one here. Yeah? And so that's this green band here in a plot where we have the size of the planets, that we can do from the transit, versus the equilibrium temperature here. We want it to have a nice temperature to be habitable, right? And so you see here there's fairly few dots, just one for the time being, but we are a bit later now. Huh? So the update is here. This is last month in a press release uh, of NASA. A total of more than 4,000 candidate planets. Candidate means that they haven't been confirmed by measuring the velocity, because that's a lot of work and we have to do it from the ground. Yeah? It takes a very long time. And here is now a plot where the orbital period is given uh, as a function of size. And all these yellow ones are confirmed, and blue ones we still need to have measurements. But anyhow, we're moving a long way. And we're coming to understand the habitable zones of solar systems, so to speak, with other host stars. Huh? And I'm showing this graph to point out to you that if you want to go somewhere to a nice place on another Earth, it depends on the star, the host star's temperature. It's nice here for us because the sun happens to have its particular temperature. But if you were to orbit a hotter star, you would want to be a bit further away, right? Yeah? Or if you want to orbit a, a, a cooler star, then you can come a bit closer. So the habitable zone, as we call it, depends on the temperature of the host star of the planet. And that's indicated here in this uh, graph. So one system that's very much alike or that comes closest to our own one was uh, found last year, well, already two years ago, by uh, the PI of Kepler here. Uh, and here you see a comparison between that system that's very far away from us, but all these planets have been found by measuring these dips in the light curve, and our own solar system. Huh? And so in our own solar system, these four planets uh, are indicated here, and three of them would be seen as being in the habitable zone by an external observer in our system. Yeah? Here is another one. Uh, 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 all these uh, stars and planets get boring numbers. Huh? We have to make telephone books sort of in inventory. So that's why they're all called Kepler and something. Huh? And this system has one planet that's in the habitable zone, several others that are clo too close to the star to be habitable, so to speak. Huh? And this one is almost like the Earth. Huh? So wouldn't it be nice if we could know what kind of atmosphere it had? Yeah? For that, we would have to do a measurement of uh, infrared spectroscopy, because we need an atmosphere for a planet to be habitable. Mars does not have an atmosphere. Huh? Venus does have a very thick one. So the circumstances for life also have to be good. 
And that's what we are trying to find out. Here are a few of the announcements of new discoveries announced last month. Huh? So this greenish area is the habitable zone, and we're trying to get there, yeah? trying to improve our statistics. And then we can hope to understand if these planets are really copies of the Earth or not. Now, as I said, I get this request. Huh? Uh, this is a cartoon from my university newspaper. If we screw it up here, can't we just fly to another one? That's the ideal picture. Well, it's not only about answering, is there an Earth too? I'm sure there are, and I guess plenty. But the ones that are candidates right now are very far away and very hard to, to check in terms of habitability. Huh? So what we want to do is give you some numbers huh? so that I put uh, you with your feet on the ground. If you ask me or order me or two to fly there. Yeah? We have plenty of planets now. But where are they? Well, they are very, the host stars that we have been studying with the Kepler mission or the Coral mission are very far away from us. To give you an idea, huh, this is the closest uh, exoplanet known to date. It circles around Alpha Centauri b. That's a, a quite bright star at this distance, 13 zeros in kilometers. Okay, But this is not a, a habitable exoplanet, so we don't want to go there because that is a gaseous planet, just like Jupiter type or, or, or Saturn type, let's say. This planet is resembling ours is at this distance. Huh? And so these numbers are overwhelming, but maybe huh, if you had heard uh, uh, there has been a landing of this comet, maybe you have heard that a few weeks ago, the European Space Agency did a stunt uh, by launching a space mission that traveled 10 years and then uh, put itself onto a comet. Well, that, after 10 years of travel, succeeded. But that's very close by. That's nothing compared to the distance to any of the exoplanets. And so with current technology, the closest planet, which is not habitable, we don't want to go there, huh? but let's say we could travel with uh, current technology, it would take us 142,000 years. Not very practical, OK? So to round off this lecture, we are going to build a new space mission in the future, a European uh, mission, to find planets around stars that are much closer to us than those that were investigated by the Kepler satellite. It's going to be named Plato. And we have 10 years to build it, but we really look forward to it. And so in the same way as we Europeans could use the NASA data, we plan to have the Americans on board as our friends to make the best out of the, of the data. This is going to be great fun. But uh, we're not yet there to move to another Earth. Eh? So uh, let me make a green statement. Please take care of our planet, because we're not yet away from here in the immediate future. And with that, I'd like to end and thank Lars and the Kavli Institute for the great hospitality here. It sort of has become my second home, and I like this place. Thank you. <laughs>
the, the more you start to deviate from this regular pattern. That's, in fact, what you have seen uh, and correctly remarked. Yeah. Um, what makes you believe that the acoustical vibrations are correlated with photometric intensity variations? So say that again? Well, you're saying there's star quakes. Yes. The brightness so, But you're changes. measuring the brightness change. So yes. why, why are those correlated? OK. And, th and then how do you separate signal from noise? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. We struggle with it every day. Anyway, uh, so first of all, if you have, qu let me give uh, the simplest quake. That's up and down and up and down, right? And so in a cycle, now the star is a bit hotter, cooler, hotter, cooler. And the brightness that you see is a, a strong function of the temperature. Yeah? So, of course, now this is a complicated picture with all these quakes together, but it comes down to uh, brightness variations that are connected with temperature variations. Yeah? From the ground, they are tiny, yeah? parts per million. Yeah? Now, that's one thing to measure the quakes. Another way, as we did from the crown before we had uh, the satellites uh, in operation, is velocity, because the quakes make the surface go up and down. And so you can measure velocities if you have a very high accurate velocity meter. And we can do that from the ground, and we are reaching levels of meters per second in, in velocity. So that's by the, the, the Doppler shift, let's say, that, uh, that we can measure. So either of the two works fine, uh, but we can't do very high precision velocity measurements from space yet. Technologically, it requires your instrument to be in a very stable uh, temperature, stable environment in order to reach that precision. And so uh, from space, we do the brightness variations. From the ground, we do the velocity variations. Yeah? That's one uh, answer. Now I forgot you had another question. Signal, signal versus ah, yeah, signal versus noise. Well, if you see these peaks, huh, then you can say that's signal, right? <laughs> but there's this grass level in the bottom of all these graphs. That's the noise level. And so we have to unravel how much the strength of the quake is above what you call noise. And at a certain moment in our analysis, we do hit noise level. Um, the, the, the point is that from space, this noise level has gone down with a factor 100. And that's why we measure so many more frequencies. So we are, we are very conservative in saying, OK, this is a quake with that frequency. I'm sure of it. We require that the signal-to-noise ratio, as we call it, is typically a factor 4, 5, 6, or even higher. Yeah? And there are many more quakes that we do not use in our analysis because we are not so sure if we are measuring real signal. Yeah? But we, have, we are so overwhelmed with frequencies now, so many quakes, that we, our models can't explain them all. So we are fine for the moment with very high signal-to-noise ratios. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a quick question <clears throat> uh, regarding the differential rotation problem, where there's a big difference between theory and experiment. Yes. Uh, is that somehow due to viscosity or other transport properties uh, and, and a lack of understanding? Yes, the, what we have learned, so that's in the red giant phase, so in the phase where our sun will be when uh, its uh, nuclear reactor uh, will be uh, stopped for a while. In that phase, uh, clearly what's going on is you have the expansion of the outer envelope, you have the shrinking of the core, but the way it goes means that we are, we're a factor 102 high if we make predictions in difference in frequency of core versus envelope. So there must be an active mechanism that makes the core of the star couple much stronger to the envelope than we had thought. Now, there are various reasons why this could be. One could be there is a magnetic field in the star, for instance, because it will not allow the faster rotation. But we can't measure magnetic fields inside stars. We can, at best, for very bright stars, measure magnetic fields at the surface. So this is one thing that we have to tweak with uh, parameters. Yeah? There could be a level of mixing that we just misinterpret. So for the moment, we are experimenting with different theoretical uh, assumptions 
just by tweaking parameters to try and understand what could be going on. Yeah? And this is, this is hard, but that's the area where we want to be in astroseismology. When we wrote this book, it was really to get us into trouble that the theory written down there wouldn't work anymore. And Jörn has written the theory chapter, so he has the hard task to solve it. <laughs> Uh, you say that they get brighter when they get uh, compressed a little bit and dim yes. when they, just just rule a, on a th estimate. The sun's huge. Are we talking a few miles bigger and smaller, or hundreds of miles bigger and smaller? Uh, let, let, let me uh, express it in in percent, say. Yeah, and this differs very much from star to star. But the, the the quakes make the surface go up and down by a tiny little bit in the case of the sun. But there are stars where you have a, a radius change of, let's say, 10%. That would be huge. These are, are big stars, supergiant stars, that also have quakes. So it's, it's from a very tiny little uh, percentage to, uh, to about 10% in radius. OK? So it'd be like 1% then? Uh, less. It's less. Yeah. Wow. So it's tiny little quakes. Yeah. And that's why it's so hard to find them. For the sun, we could do that from the ground, because we have solar uh, telescope networks. But for distant stars, it was already discovered from the ground, uh, these, these uh, non-radial quakes. But only in 2001 was the first confirmed case of these uh, uh, quakes with, with different nodal lines. We knew of stars that had bigger radial quakes already since uh, about a century. That we can see very easily. But we can't do seismology with them, because remember, I need all these yellow and green. I need a lot of quakes to make an inference on the interior structure. Okay, So from, from very tiny to quite huge. Sorry? Carbon stars, is that the same? Uh, talking about the stars, they get into carbon stars. Carbon stars are, are in fact, red supergiants. Uh, I, I don't know if you mean that, uh, or if you mean the, the, the carbon uh, oxygen leftover, the big ones. Yeah, so there, uh, that's a good question. That's yet further evolved, and uh, stars will not become giants, like the red giants I showed, but super giants, even more. And so these stars then also start to lose their outer layers, because they are so large that they, their layers become loose, so to speak. And they have a wind. They lose their material. And that wind sort of makes it really hard for us to find these tiny little quakes that are going on at the surface. So there are carbon stars where we have, again, this big, huge quake one going on. And we understand that, but that's not, we need a lot more to do this type of work. We need the tiny little non-radial quakes. And there we are, there are three stars, I think, in the Kepler mission right now where we think that they may be in that stage. But it's very experimental at this, uh, at this moment, I would say. The Plato mission that we will develop now will take a whole broad range of stars, much broader range than Kepler has searched for. So in 10 years from now, I can uh, give another lecture on no, that. No, you can't really get to give one. <laughs> Sorry? Only one. Only, only one. one. Only to give one. Um, how do you differentiate between um, your change in size and solar flares? Or is it the propagation of the star quakes that makes a difference? Or do you have to make a correlation between the, um, the physical expansion and the brightness? Because I know the solar flare flares are probably the same brightness as the surface, aren't they? Uh, it, but yeah, but solar flares are eruptive phenomena, right? It happens violently every once in a while. And so what we do is analyze of the quakes are extremely periodic, very irregular. And we can filter out these two from each other because of that reason. Flares or coronal mass ejection, which are completely important for space weather type things, they are not regularly periodic phenomena that disturbs the, the measurements of the quakes. That's how we unravel that. Okay. Now, in a flare or in a coronal mass ejection, the sun spits out some material. 
but that's so tiny compared to the material it still has that it's just a minor disturbance. And it, it doesn't disturb the measurements of the uh, solar quakes because of the periodicity aspect. They don't have, they don't have well, we are now trying to see uh, quakes during a flare. That's fascinating. It's something that we know for the sun and that we would like to try and measure for other stars. But we, for the moment, do not have any equipment that can really disentangle tiny seismic signal during a flare. But that is one of the projects I've just submitted to get grant money. <laughs> so maybe, maybe also uh, in a few years from now. Yeah, final question. So um, is there a connection between uh, star quakes or more specifically these modal oscillations and then certain classes of variable stars? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we have a whole range uh, of classes of variable stars. There are many and several of many of them, most of them have quakes. Now, some just have up and down and up and down. That's what we call classical radio pulsators. Others have very uh, uh, non-radial oscillations. S all stars like the sun have that. I didn't go into that detail, but the, the quakes are in fact caused by the uh, bubbling gas that is going on. But you also have stars that have no uh, bubbling gas, but more uh, quiet radiative atmospheres, and they also can quake because there is a thermodynamic cycle. And then you have variability like eruptions that is, has nothing to do with uh, seismic uh, quakes, or you also have variability due to binarity. There are some stars that live together and they revolve around each other. That gives also variability, and then they transfer mass towards each other. It gives also variability. There is magnetic variability that creates spots on stars and that also rotates, but that would only go with the rotation period. So there again, we can know that this is not uh, non-radial modes because uh, rotational variability, as we call it, goes with one frequency, namely the frequency of the surface rotation. And so there are, and then there you have combinations of all these types of, of variability that is going on. But our analysis methods are fairly good in unraveling these because we know the frequencies to be expected for these different phenomena. And so that's a, a fascinating aspect where we will have uh, from, from the Gaia mission that's now ongoing, one billion stars. All of them will be variable at some level. And it's fascinating also in terms of, of, of coding, computer codes, to, to classify all these variabilities. So that is yet another aspect of this research field. Yeah. All right, let's thank Connie one more time. Let me remind everyone that we do have uh, light refreshments and cookies in the near the courtyard. So if you want to do that, you're, we can go out in that direction. <laughs>